Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Lair. I'm from Iowa. When I say Iowa, you say God's country. You know, I travel a lot, and, uh, and when you get further away from Iowa, somebody always yells out, potatoes! That's Idaho, folks. <laughs> but you're too close to Iowa. You're smarter than that. Well, I'm so glad to be here this morning. We're going to talk about this message, How to Fix Your Spouse. We're going to unpack some tools that we use to start fixing people. We learn these tools when we're young. And I want to speak to you this morning, right now, if you are young and not married. And I see a lot of you in the audience, young girls, young ladies, young men. And you're probably thinking, he's talking about marriage. I'm checking out. I don't want you to. And here's why. Marriage is closer to you than what you think. Like, it's right around the corner. And I want to share a couple thoughts with you in this sermon that I hope you hang on to. So stay tuned in. And if you're here this morning, maybe you're older and widowed or divorced and never to marry again, I want you to stay tuned in because people are going to come to you and they're, they're going to want answers. Like they want out. Maybe it's a son, a daughter, a, a friend, a coworker, and they're going to come to you and I want you to be ready. And so whether you're married or not, happy, sad, glad, or mad, stay tuned in. And I want to unpack this message for you. I don't have the perfect marriage uh, like Amy apparently has. Uh, <laughs> Pastor, I think you've got work to do with that. <laughs> and a, a special thank you to Pastor Amy and Pastor Steve for allowing me to be here and treating me so well. I've been treated so well, I think I might move here. Is that okay? All right. All right. All right. It's done. Yeah. Can, I, can I move in with you, Pastor? Or? Talk later. Okay, okay. So... Talk to your wife. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> We're not perfect. And so look at the person next to you right now and just look right at him and tell him this. You're not perfect. Tell him. <laughs> Take your time. You might have to tell him twice. We're all flawed and we bring issues into the room. Before I get into the text this morning, before we start talking about these tools, I have to be honest with you. I don't have a perfect marriage, even though my wife is beautiful and she's smart and she's strong. Um, we have issues, right? We all do. And I'll never forget, a couple days after we got married, we, uh, moved, we moved her out of her condo into my home. And so I get there, and we load up all of her furniture, and Pam is super organized, and she's very detailed. And, and I'm guessing the furniture was probably alphabetized, knowing her from A to Z, and then it was double-wrapped and packed and safety and safety and safety. And, you know, I'm not any of those things. I'm like, yeah, that's not me. And so we get it all loaded in the trailer, and she comes up to me, and she says, now, Matt, when we drive across town, drive slow. I'm like, yeah, okay, okay. And then she climbs in the trailer and puts her arms around her her, pri you know, her possessions, her furniture, so it won't get scratched. I mean, I watched my beautiful wife climb into a trailer that's open, and I'm thinking, this must be what wives do. <laughs> this is all new to me. And we take off. And I live in a larger city, so I'm weaving in and out of traffic, you know, and I'm trying to pay attention. And all of a sudden, I saw a Taco Bell. And I got hungry for a taco because I love tacos. And, all, you know, and, and the problem is the light right at that intersection turned yellow. So men, what do you do when a light turns yellow? You. So I gunned it, completely forgot she was even back there. I'm like, and I whip it to the left and whip it to the right, and the trailer completely gets disconnected and it passes me. Pam doesn't even know it. She's got her head down and she flies by me and I'm like, Pam, hold on. And it slammed right into Taco Bell. So she gets out and then I get out and we exchanged words. And then I go in and get three tacos and a Mountain Dew. I'm like, I'm sticking to my plan here. And I'm looking out the window at this beautiful woman shaking her head like, what did I just marry? And the truth is, even though this story is true, it's sort of also a metaphor, especially for you young ones. Here's what happens. We have issues before we get married. We have patterns. We, have, we bring all these issues, and we kind of try to hide them, don't we? We conceal them. I don't want Pam to know everything or she won't marry me. So I have luggage. I have baggage, and I hide it. And I bring it into marriage, and over the next couple years, it's like zip, zip, zip. I open it all up, and here it all is. And she brings in her luggage and her baggage, and we start to have conflict. We start to fix each other. And if you're here and you're young, we start learning how to use these tools way before we're married. 
And the first tool that I want to talk about before we get into the text is the hammer. You know, we use this to fix relationships or we're, we're not happy. And so my question is, why is a godly man, why is it a godly woman chooses this so quickly? Why is this our first choice? And anger, the Bible says anger, anger is not an accident. It says that human anger, get this, it says it never produces the righteousness of God. I choose it. I grab it. And I think about all the times I've used this on Pam or maybe a coworker, or maybe a brother or a sister. It's never produced anything good. It doesn't fix anything. It doesn't work. It's a choice. It's not an accident. And as I mature in my faith, I try to just walk away from this thing. We'll talk more about it in a moment. Here's another tool that we often use is a screwdriver, and I call this manipulation. Like, I'll behave in a certain way where I'll get what I want. Boy, don't we learn how to do this. We're two and three and four years old. I'll act in a way. I'll behave. I mean, maybe you're a husband who's affectionate, and maybe you come home from work, and maybe you open your wife's door, and maybe she gives you a kiss on the cheek, and maybe you have a nice, intimate relationship until you're not happy. And you go cold. Maybe you're, you, you shut down. It's like, I'll show you. I'll fix you. I'll quit talking. Silent treatment. Or I'll pull away. Or I'll quit opening your door. Or maybe, some of you don't know this, but anger often is a form of manipulation. It's like, you either give me what I want or deal with my wrath. It's your choice. It's manipulating. It's a tool that I choose. And it doesn't work. And I'm guilty. How about you? Another tool that we often use, and you can't quite see this one from where you're sitting, it's a little handsaw. It's got little fine teeth on it, and it cuts, and it cuts deep. And I call this words, just simply words. You know, I don't have to yell, I don't have to curse. Why is it sometimes that the, we use the worst words on the people we love the most? You would never say that to a stranger. You would never say that to somebody you didn't know. But why is it? And, 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 you know, sometimes we don't realize that words have the power of life and death. Words have the power of making somebody feel valuable. The Bible says life and death come from our tongue. And I know there are times in your life that somebody has spoken words into you. Maybe it was a pastor, a mother, a friend, and, and a spouse. And the words made you feel valuable. Like you could, there was no mountain you couldn't climb and no ocean you couldn't swim. But likewise, I could interview you and find a time when somebody hurt you. They cut. Like, finish this quote for me. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never. That's a lie from the devil. You see, bones heal and bruises go away. But often the words that we use hurt people. I live in the arena of broken people. We have over 70,000 mentors all over the world, and I live in the arena of hurt and pain. And the words that we choose matter. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty of using these words that hurt my wife. How about you? I only have a couple more. This is sort of like a guide tool. Earplugs. Like, I don't like what I'm hearing. I certainly don't want to hear from my wife, so I'll tune her out. Or maybe you tune out your parents. You tune out your pastor. You tune out God. It's a tool. I don't like what I'm hearing. I, I don't want to change. Put them in. Men can do it. Women can do it. I've done it. You know, it's funny. When we tune out God, he has to use other means to get to us. And the number one tool that God often uses to speak to me is through my wife. Am I listening? My pastor, am I listening? It's a tool that we use. and It doesn't work. And lastly, have you thought of all the ways you could fix somebody with duct tape? <laughs> of all the things you could do. And I look at this tool, sort of this issue, like it's a power struggle in a marriage. It's more so now than it's ever been. But if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, you'll find out that Adam and Eve struggled with this early on. One of the curses upon Adam and Eve was that she would fight for his position. And this power struggle is nothing new. Or sometimes I'm not happy with what Pam says to me. And so I'm like, come here, Pam. I want to fix her. I want her to come closer. And I'll take a piece of duct tape. And I'll say, hey, honey, come closer, come closer. And I want to silence her. I want to silence my wife. My question for you this morning as you look at these tools is this, whether you're young or old, maybe you're a child, maybe you're an adult, is this, what tools did you bring in the room? 
You see, I want to make a connection right now that these tools are my flesh. It's my sin nature. I'm born with it. You're born with it. The Bible says every day we must die to our flesh. My sin. I want you to know that your sin operates like a fingerprint. You have a very unique way of sinning that's unique to you. And the Bible says it's good for us to look in the mirror long enough to own it, to understand it, to not just look in the mirror and walk away as if we've never looked in the mirror before. And I was praying one night, upset with Pam. And here's what God said to me with this loud voice in my prayer. He says, Matt, put your tools down and walk away. I'm like, what do you mean, God? He says, put your tools down. You're in my way. What, what do you mean, God? And he said, every time that I use my tools on Pam, they hurt her. They wound her. Every time you use your flesh on other people, number one, they don't work. But number two, it hurts them. And he says, now, Matt, because of you, Pam's heart is becoming hardened. And now, Matt, because of you, your wife isn't even listening to me. And then God reminded me. He said, I sit on the throne, not you. I fix people, not you. I have the power to help Pam. And God also said to me, I'm working with Pam with my timetable, not yours. Put your tools down and walk away from them. And if that's the case, and if you're with me this morning, and you're like, okay, man, I get it. I'm guilty. Then what can I do? What is my recourse? What is the solution? And I'm glad you asked because it's right here. You see, God has answers. God has some things that we can do that's proactive and preemptive, and it works and I want you to open your Bibles this morning to 2 Chronicles 7.14. And I'm going to give you a formula that you can memorize. It's very, very simple. And we've trained people all over the world how to do this in 2 Chronicles 7.14. And as you open up your Bibles this morning, I want you to know that this is not a marriage verse. This is a verse of reconciliation between us <coughs> and God. And King Solomon just completed a temple. And God lays out this formula so that the people can reunite with God and rebuild a broken relationship with him. If you go to the second book of Hosea, God actually uses the vernacular that we are his wife and he is our husband. He uses the wife-husband connection there. And even at the end of Hosea, he repeats this formula. And he says, my wife, God says, my wife has cheated on me, has committed adultery against me. And then if you look closely, God uses this formula again to show the reconciliation power. And I thought, my goodness, if that works between us and God, I'll bet you it would work between a husband and a wife. And boy, does it. I've seen miracles all over the country with this. And I want to unpack this for you. So let's look at it. The first thing it says here is, if my people. If my people who are called by my name. Let's stop right there. If, if, if. That's a mathematical equation. The word if is actually part of code writing and math. And God says, if my people, if, do these three things, then. Then is the output of the word if. Then is part of the math. He says, if you do this, then God says, I'll do this. And God's blessings and his healing is conditional. He doesn't just randomly bless. He says, follow my ways. He says, if my people who are called by my name do three things. Humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. And turn away from your own, look at this for a second, wicked. And when I first read this 20 years ago and I created this message, I got to that part of the scripture and I'm like, man, he's not talking to me. I'm not wicked. That's the pagans. These are the, the, the Christian killers. These are the God haters. And I go to church every Sunday and I sing and I raise my hands and I pay my tithes or offerings. And, you know, and we feel that way. And all of a sudden, as I'm wrestling with this, God says, whoa, whoa, Matt, time out. He says, every time you use your flesh, it's wicked. Every time I turn to my flesh, it's wicked. Every time I take matters in my own hands, it's wicked. He is talking to me. My sin is wicked. Your sin is wicked. He is talking to you. And he says, if you humble yourself and seek me and turn from your flesh, then, oh, I love the word then in scripture. It gives hope. He says, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll forgive you. And here it is. I'll heal your land. I'll heal your home. I'll heal your marriage. I'll heal your heart. And maybe you've got a strained relationship between you and your father, you and your mother. Maybe it's you and your child. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a brother. I do all kinds of family interventions. This formula works. I'll heal you. And what I want to do this morning is I want to go backwards and I want to, I want to break this down even deeper and help you apply it. 
And so the first thing God says in this formula, this mathematical chronological equation, is he says, number one, you're hurting. Number one, he goes, humble yourself. Step one, become humble. Let me tell you something. That's the hardest step. It's so hard to be humble anyway when life is good. We're we're a selfish people. But I want you to know that there's a time in your life where it's 10 times harder to be humble. It's when somebody hurts you, betrays you, wounds you, lies to you, calls you a name. They're unloving. They're disrespectful. It's in that moment when Pam is not good to me, not kind to me, that God says, Matt, be humble. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm a victim. I'm a victim to somebody else's behavior. And God, you're telling me to be humble? Yes. Yes. If there were one character trait that I would repeat a thousand times into a child, this is it. The Bible speaks all over about humility. It's found over 88 times in Scripture. Humble and humility. God says, I give grace and mercy to the humble. But he says, I oppose the proud. I oppose the proud. It's one of the reasons I think God favored King David was because of his humility, not because of his perfection. Be humble. How? How can you be humble? I've got a few practical things. Number one, somebody uses their hammer on you. Keep yours in its holster. That takes humility. If somebody calls you names, use duct tape, but put it on your own cell. Bite your tongue until it bleeds. You see, I want you to know that when you get saved, God gives you the Holy Spirit, a supernatural ability to do that which you could never do before. You have a supernatural ability to love people that are unlovable, to be kind to people that are not kind to you, to return fire with love and kindness. You have a supernatural ability that you should and could tap into called the Holy Spirit. Are you? Are you doing that? Are you being humble in a situation where you're the victim? Man, I never said this would be easy, but boy, is it effective. I got upset one time with Pam, and I got in the car, and I tore off. I was like, I'll show her, and I floored it, and I squealed the tires when I tore off from our home. I'm like, "Ah!" anybody here ever do that? Raise your hand. Pastor, there's a few more honest people in this service than the last one. (laughs) And I, I get a couple blocks down the road, and all of a sudden, God knocked on my head, and he goes, hey, Matt, 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 what are you doing? I'm like, this is not a good time, God. Can you come back later? (laughs) I'm I'm busy with something right now. And the Holy Spirit in me is like, Matt, what are you doing? What are you doing? And you know, when God confronts you with your behavior, you know what we often do is we have a whole list of of grievances against the other person. Well, God, did you see what Pam said to me? Did did you see what she did? did? Did you see what my dad did? Did you see what my... And God says, I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you. He goes, what are you doing? I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've called you to love other people. I've called you to love those who hurt you, love those who hate you, love those who wound you. I've I've given you a superpower of a supernatural Holy Spirit. What are you doing? What are you doing? By the way, God says, Matt, I sent my son to die on the cross for her. You know, God sent his son to die on the cross for the people that hurt you. And in this micro moment, I became convicted. I'm like, the Holy Spirit split me wide open. And I humbled myself. And I whipped into a grocery store and I bought Pam flowers. While I was mad at her. Have you ever bought flowers for somebody when you're mad at them? Because it's really weird. I walked up to the counter. I'm still a little jacked up, you know, and I got the happiest little high school girl in the world behind the counter. And she's like, oh, you're going to buy your wife flowers. That's so wonderful. You're a great husband. I was like, what kind are you going to get her? Cheapest kind you got. (laughs) Whack off the heads and wrap the stems, I think I might have said. No, I didn't do that. So I get Pam these flowers because I humbled myself and I, I get in the car and I turn around and I go home and I kept looking at the flowers and I kept look, thinking about the way I spoke to her and I kept looking at the flowers and I kept replaying how I treated her and I pulled in my driveway and I sat there and I just started to weep. I'm like, God, forgive me. I'm such a fool. You know what happened between the flower shop and my driveway? God healed me. He healed me. It didn't even matter what Pam said or did. And I was hoping, like in the movies, you know, I'd kick the door open and she'd fall into my arms. Yeah, that did not happen. (laughs) But a couple days later, she said, when you walked in with those flowers, it made me glad I married you. Humble yourself. Humble you. 
Look in the mirror. This is another one. Look in the mirror on all situations and all conflict. What could I have said different? What could I have done different? Fear God more than man. Look at how I can change. Don't return fire with fire. Bite my tongue until it bleeds. Love people who hurt me. And let God take care of it. Now we go to step two. It's to seek God. In this formula, he says, now that you humbled yourself, now you can seek me. You know, when you seek God, that takes humility. And this is a chronological formula, which a lot of people want the outcome before the work. They're like, God, fix me first. Hey, God, heal me first, and then I'll do all that. And God says, no, humble yourself. And God says, come to me. You got a broken marriage? Put it right here. Come on, seek me. Come on, come up here. God, God says, give it to me. I'll take it. I'll fix it. And this one frustrates me because I have couples all over the world, men and women, husbands and wives. They're not seeking the Lord. I just want a divorce. I just want out. I'll take the matter in my own hands. You hurt me, I'll cut you out of my life. You wound me, I'll cut you out. And this breaks God's heart because he says, listen, I created the universe. I got this. I can fix this. Or maybe it's a relationship between you and a parent. I cut my dad out of my life forever because of what he did to me. And this grieves God because he said, oh, I could heal that. I could heal that. Will you let me? How? Well, there's a handful of ways to seek the Lord. One is to read his word. Like his, this word has the solution to all of life's pain and suffering. There, there are some of the best psychology and counseling ideas in here that you'll ever find anywhere on the planet. You won't find healing anywhere else but here. Amen? Amen. God says, seek me. Seek me. Or maybe you seek someone who is following the Lord. See, sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need to reach out and get help. And when you seek someone who loves the Lord, you're seeking the Lord. And that's why I'm here this weekend. We trained a bunch of marriage mentors this weekend. And if you're here this morning, I want all of you uh, to pull this out of the back seat in front of you, the chair. It's a little sign-up card. Please, all of you, married or not, happy, sad, glad, everybody, please pull it out really quick. And here's what it says. It says, we would like to get mentored. And if that's you this morning, maybe you need a little bit of help. Maybe you need a lot of help. Maybe you need a refresher. Maybe, you, maybe you're, you're struggling. The couples that we trained are trained to meet with you alone, privately, and confidential, maybe three weeks, maybe five, maybe ten. And they're going to walk with you and they're going to love on you and they're going to help you humble yourself and seek God in turn. That's what they're trained to do. All you have to do is sign the card. And at the end of the service, all of you turn the cards in on the way out the door, signed or unsigned. If you didn't sign it, turn it in. If you did, turn it in so that nobody's going to be embarrassed. Nobody's going to notice. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you want to mentor other couples, maybe you have a solid marriage and, and you want to help other couples, then when you sign it, put, we want to be a mentor because we're going to offer another training in a month. Help is on the way. And you have the rest of this message to wrestle with this. And for many of you right now, you know, because God is speaking to you, that you need to sign the card. And you might be like, well, Matt, that's embarrassing. That's humbling. Yeah, I know. We covered that one. Humble yourself. I'll be at the table afterwards if you want to come talk to me about it. And I have a few things to help your marriage, a little date night cards to spice up your date nights after you've been married and all you talk about is kids and money and work and I have many other things. Seek God. Seek Him before you get out. Why? Here it is. Because your marriage is more than a marriage. Your marriage isn't there to just make you happy. Your marriage is built by the Lord for his calling and his anointing to fall upon you. So as goes your marriage, goes your calling. As goes your marriage, goes your anointing. And then not only does it affect you, but God can, he can take your anointing and your calling and it will fall upon your children and their children and their children. It's a big deal. So if you need a little bit of help, get it. Pam and I have. Get help. Seek him. Before I move on to the last piece of the formula, I want to talk to the young ones. I'll start with the young girls, the young ladies. And I see a few in the room. And I want you to make a promise this morning. And I want to talk to you about your future husband. I want to talk to you about the, the, the boy, the man that you're going to meet, and it's going to make you feel all weird inside. 
And I want you to make a promise, and here it is. I want, before you go on one date with this man or this boy, before you go on one date, I want you to do something. I want you to investigate him. And I want you to look at three things. How does he treat his mother? How does he treat his father? And does he love Jesus? And if he loves Jesus and he treats his parents well, then go on one date. But if he doesn't, walk away. Don't go on one date if you've been an investigator and he doesn't prove to you that he knows Jesus and he loves Jesus and that he's good to his parents. And it's going to save you a lot of hurt and a lot of heartache because your heart can fall in love so quickly with someone that doesn't love Jesus. And when you get married someday, ladies, I want you to have a husband who's going to go buy you flowers when you mistreat him. And the only way that can happen is if the Holy Spirit is leading him and the Holy Spirit is knocking on his head and he responds. And if he loves Jesus, that will happen. And the same thing for you young men. I don't care how pretty she is. I don't care how popular she is. I don't care how much she likes you. Be an investigator. And if if she's good to her parents and she loves the Lord, you're okay. But if she doesn't, walk away. Save yourself a lot of pain. Yeah, but Matt, maybe, maybe she'll find Jesus later. Yeah, that's possible, but it's not highly probable. Do you want to roll the dice? If they don't love Jesus, walk away. Amen, parents? And if you made that promise this morning, tell somebody. Tell somebody. I want you to have a wife like mine. Every time there's trials and tribulations in our marriage or in our life, you know what she turns to? I've seen her do it hundreds and hundreds of times. Man, she turns to this. What a woman. She's offered me a lot of mercy, a lot of forgiveness, and a lot of grace. She's loved me at times in our marriage. I didn't deserve it. That's what I want for you. And that leads us to the third piece of the formula. Humble yourself, seek God, now turn from my ways, turn from my sin, turn from my pattern, turn from my tools. And over time, this becomes possible. Turn. This morning, I hope you look at this and you're like, man, that's right, Matt. These things have done me no good. Turn, run, walk away from them every day. And I'd say this to my wife all the time. This is not the man I want to be. That's not who I want to be. And if it ever creeps back in, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, Pam. Go on a quest. Turn. And as I close this morning, I want to share a final story with you. Because this has such a huge, huge impact on your anointing and your calling. And here it is. Years ago, a guy came to me and he shared this story. And here's what he said. I got, I got married at a young age. My, my girlfriend got pregnant at 14. Can you imagine? He said, I did it all wrong. We entered into marriage all wrong. We had no money. She was 15 when they had their first child. He was 19. Then they had another child. He goes off to the military, comes back. They go to a small Assembly of God church, and they get saved, but their marriage gets worse. He comes home from work one night, and there was a note on his refrigerator from his wife, and here's what it said. I don't love you anymore. I'm going to go be with another man. I've been seeing this other man for quite a while. Here's what she said. You can have the girls. And this woman abandoned her post as a mother, and she abandoned her post as a wife. And there he stood at a crossroad. What do I do? You see, I think there's two paths in life when somebody hurts you. There's the path that I just preached on called the path led by the Holy Spirit. It's supernatural. I'm going to wait and pray. I'm going to, I can't fix my spouse, but I'm going to let God take it over and see what he can do. But most people take this path. I call it the path of contempt. I'm going to hold you in contempt for what you've done to me. And it yields all kinds of things, divorce and cutting ties. And I don't know how or why, but here's what this man did. He decided to take this path, and he says, I'm going to pray for my wife every day, and I'm going to wait. And the weeks went on, and the months went on, all alone. His friends thought he was crazy and nuts. And he says, no, I'm going to wait. And about a year later, he gets a knock at the door, and he opens it up, and there she stood, broken, broken scared, lonely. Will you take me back? And he said, yeah, I've been waiting. And he takes her in and he loves her all the days of her life. They they ended up staying married 60 years. And they had four more sons later. See, do you do the math here? Four sons that would never have been. And one of those sons is me. Do you see it? My dad had no idea that his decision was going to yield my life. 
He had no idea that he would have a son who would leave a career and build a ministry where now thousands of people are trained all over the world. He had no idea that his wife would come home. He had no idea that his wife would fall in love with him. He had no idea they would become inseparable. He had no idea all the miracles on the other side of that hill. Nor do you. I used to call my dad after every trip. Hey, Dad, I was in California, Canada, New York, Minnesota. Hey, Dad, we're at 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 mentors. Hey, Mom. Mom, thanks for coming home. Hey, Dad, thanks for forgiving. But I can't call either one now because they're gone. But their legacy lives on. Their anointing lives on. That's what I want for you. That's what God wants for you. Humble yourself. Seek the Lord. Turn from your flesh. See what God can do. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we close today, there are people in this room, Lord, that are waging what to do. Do I sign a card or don't I? Would you give them the courage? Father, would you bless the leadership in this church so it's a greater, stronger, brighter lighthouse than it's ever been, that people would come from all over. We'll give you all the glory, Lord. We'll take none of it. Father, I pray for the couples. I pray for the mentors that you let your anointing fall. So much is at stake, Lord. We we'll lay all this in front of you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Would you join me and thank Matt? Thank you, Matt, for blessing us this morning. I, I just want to echo what Pastor Matt said, and that is, if you need help, humble yourself. If it wasn't for the grace of God, my wife and I would be divorced. We've went through difficulties in our marriage. But by the grace of God, we got help. And I just want to encourage you today that victory comes from vulnerability and humble yourself and get help. That's my encouragement to you. Humble yourself, seek God's face, and turn from your wicked ways. Don't focus on what the other person is doing wrong. Look in the mirror, because that's the only person you can change and control. So may God help you. Um, to get help if you need it. And then also, some of you, I just want to encourage you to become a marriage mentor. You've got a solid marriage, and you can help others on this journey. And do you know something I've found is that when I help others, it helps me. Does that make sense? Like, when I help other couples in their marriage, it reminds me, oh, am I doing this stuff? And, and it's very healthy. So um, number one, do you need marriage mentoring? Humble yourself. God Resist the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And then is God asking you to help others in their marriage and to mentor them? So thank you so much for doing that. We're going to move on to our uh, times of offering. And thank you so much for your generosity. It makes ministries like this possible where we help other people. And um, it helps us not only in our local ministry, but as you met Pastor Kevin today, um, this week on social media, we got a, someone said thank you, and they're from Sweden. You know, so our ministry is impacting people literally all over the world. So thank you so much for your generosity. There's a few ways you can give. You can give through our church app. You can text give if you've never done that before. You just text the word give to 507-204-7475. There's our website. You can give through our website. You can send it in the mail, those of you who are watching online, wherever you are, to 27. 337 County Highway 34, Casson, Minnesota. You can also give in person. As you leave, there'll be some boxes and you can drop your offerings in there. Thank you so much uh, for your generosity. Well, next week we have a huge treat for you as well. Is uh, We have Theater for the Thirsty. How many of you have ever seen Theater for the Thirsty? Would you raise your hands? You say, well, what is Theater for the Thirsty? It's this really talented couple who use the love of arts and, and drama and play to communicate the gospel. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So if you have never been here, I would encourage you to give it a shot. It is amazing. Um, also, we have these, these tickets, and we want to encourage you to get them. I believe they're at the Welcome 
center and hand them out to people. It, this is a great way to, uh, you know, my wife and I, we, we like to go and watch <coughs> plays, like at the Chanhassen Dinner Theater, or Lanesboro has a place you can see plays. It, this is just as good a quality. It's very excellent. So I want to encourage you to invite people to come and join us next week. We will have friends up here to pray with you if you would like someone uh, to pr pray with you. I just want to encourage you to bow your heads for a moment. God, I pray that you would reveal to us the destructive tools that we may be using, anger, manipulation, mean-spirited words, tuning out others, the power struggle. God, help us to admit that to you and humble ourselves. And I pray that as we seek your face, you will bring healing in our relationship with our spouse, with our kids, with our neighbor. Friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Now may you go in the grace and the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Now everyone hands in one of these. I'm going to hand one in as well. So if you would just please hand that in. There will be people uh, waiting at the doors there. Have a great week.